Good morning, everyone. Welcome. Oh, it's so good to say that again. Welcome to worship here at Ferrysburg Community Church. We're just going to open with a song, and then we will get on with the rest of the service. But it's so wonderful to see everybody here this morning. Good morning and welcome to Ferrysburg Community Church. It's cool to be here, standing here, giving this welcome. I've done it recorded. I've done it here. I like it better here. Yeah. Although recording isn't bad in the woods or on the beach. I'm just a guy who used to listen to and watch a TV show. So welcome back, welcome back, welcome back. And welcome to everyone who's watching online and in the overflow room. A shout out to my family. Last week, Emily texted me and said, Dad, how many people are there? Are you there? Yes, I am. So hi, Emily. Hi, Emily. And everyone in the overflow, welcome. We have a couple of announcements. Um, the women's coffee. Uh, plan to join us, not me, join us at North Shore Beach on Monday morning, August 3, 9.15 to 11. Bring your own drink or snack. Um, if a ride is needed, please call Jan Bross, and we hope to see you for this warm welcome and time of socializing with each other, and that's rain or shine. So um, plan on being there no matter what. Youth group fire night, 
meeting for the final fire night of the summer this Tuesday, August 4, from 8 to 10. Uh, join us on the patio for worship, fellowship, and s'mores. Sixth through twelfth graders are invited. Also mark your calendar for the kickoff on August 11. So thank you. Welcome back. Woo! Thank you, Kyle. Um, will you please stand? Uh, I would like to also, yeah, welcome back. Um, as we sing this first song, um, speaking of welcoming, um, we just want to look ahead to the future hope we have in, in glory. Um, later on, we're going to sing Living Hope, but this first song, What a Friend, and the welcome we have in Jesus, because he has taken on our burdens, all the things that we struggle with in this life, devastation, sorrow, trials, heartbreak, isolation. Unlike any other world religion, we have a belief that our Redeemer, Savior, our friend has experienced that, the ultimate betrayal he experienced on the cross. And that is what we're going to rejoice about this morning as our true, true, dearest friend, the friend of sinners. Please sing. Amen. 
And good morning and welcome, and this is a greeting that God gives us today as we gather. Grace, mercy, and peace is ours from God our Heavenly Father and His Son, Jesus Christ, who is our truest friend, and the Holy Spirit, who right now is alive within every single one of us. Amen. Amen. Well, you can have a seat, and I can, I'm going to invite the praise team to to sit down as well. We got a couple things that we need to do here this morning. Um, one, of the, one of the blessings that we have as a church family is that we are, um, we are not a pastor-led church. I mean, I know I get up and I do most of the talking, but ultimately it is, uh, it is the congregation and specifically people who are selected and appointed to serve in a leadership role. Um, back when we were watching the service on our devices completely, um, we installed a group of new elders and deacons. And we've had a development since then. Um, Michelle Skitma uh, was a deacon, and she had a change in her work schedule that really um, made it impossible for her to fulfill her responsibilities um, as a deacon. Uh, and so uh, she has needed to step down and uh, we're grateful to Michelle for, uh, for the, the year or so that she invested in our church family for her faithfulness over the last year. And since then, we have asked a person who was originally one of the potential deacons when we selected um, new elders and deacons. And um, we've, we've talked to him and he's agreed to serve the rest of Michelle's term. So she's got two years left and that is Kevin Artema. So, we installed our other elders and deacons, and right now we are going to install Kevin as well. And so um, just a note about deacons, uh, just a reminder that, that deacons are responsible for stewardship. They're responsible for uh, the ministry of mercy that we extend to people in Jesus' name. They're responsible for practical help and encouragement. And so that is one of the things that Kevin is going to be doing. Kevin specifically will be serving as an administrative deacon. And uh, so he will be focused more on uh, stewardship of our resources and things like that. So Kevin, I'd like to ask you if you would stand and answer just a few questions here. Uh, Kevin, first of all, do you believe that in the call of this congregation, God himself is calling you to these holy offices? Do you believe that the Old and New Testament are the Word of God, the only infallible rule of faith and life? Do you subscribe to the doctrinal standards of this church, rejecting all teaching which contradicts them? And finally, do you promise to do the work of your offices faithfully, in a way worthy of your calling, and in submission to the government and discipline of the church? Kevin, what is your answer? Thank you. And uh, Kevin, before you sit down, uh, we'd like to say a prayer for you. So would you please join me in, in praying for Kevin? God, we thank you that you have given Kevin a willing heart, a heart that is willing to serve you in this way. And we ask that uh, as he uh, moves forward in this role, that you would grant him everything he needs to discharge his duties well. Lord, we pray that you'll protect him and his family during this time. Um, as, as leaders, often we are more exposed to uh, the attacks of the enemy, and we pray that you will protect Kevin and his family. We pray that you'll strengthen him to do your good work with, uh, with energy and with enthusiasm. And Lord, we pray that you'll give him the wisdom and the grace that he'll need to, uh, to serve you and to serve us as a deacon. And Lord, help us to remember that, that that's what Kevin is. He is a servant and to support him in this role through our prayers and through our encouragement as well. So we thank you for providing leadership that reflects your heart and the heart of your son, Jesus Christ. And we pray in his name, amen. Thanks, Kevin. During phase one of our, uh, of our in-person worship, one of the things that we're not doing is having uh, children's programming. And so kids, um, you know, normally this would be a time when we dismiss you to go to a, a classroom, an environment where you can learn more about Jesus. So what we've decided to do is we're going to bring some of the programming, some of the environment and experience that you get uh, in the 
back wing of church right here into the sanctuary. And so um, last week, Mrs. Housecamp did this. This morning, I'm going to share uh, some thoughts. Then we're calling this our kids grow moment because kids are important to us. And, and it's our desire to help kids grow deep roots of faith um, through their experience here at Ferrysburg Community Church. All right. So this morning, kids, we are going to be talking about rules. And I don't know how you feel about rules, but I suspect that um, you're not that crazy about them. Because most of the time, rules are just a bunch of things that you can't do, right? And often things that you want to do, but no, there's a rule against that. And when, when you go to school, you're going to discover there again that there's a whole bunch of rules. And this year, there's going to be even more rules than there was last year. And it's hard. So what do we make about rules? How are we supposed to think about rules? Well, let me give you one example of how rules function in our lives, okay? So I've got a marble here. So let's say you are this marble, and this, this plate is your life. And so if I put you on this plate, and, and then you start moving around and stuff like that, whoop, it's not that hard for you to fall right off. I mean, there's, there's, you want to move around and you want to run, but then the problem is there's nothing keeping you on the plate. There's nothing that's keeping you safe here on this plate. But if we add some rules, if we put some, some sides up on something like this, then, well, you can just move around as much as you want. I don't know if you can see that, but man, you can just go like crazy and you don't have to worry about it because the rules are protecting you and they're keeping you safe and they're keeping you from falling away or falling uh, outside of a place where you uh, need to be. So that's how rules function in our lives. Rules are a way that God protects us. They're a way that he keeps us safe. And I know sometimes they're not that much fun. And I'm going to be talking about rules a little bit later in our service today, too. But when you bump up against a rule that you really don't care that much for, remember that sometimes God and our parents and our teachers give us rules. And the purpose isn't to not let us have any fun. The purpose is to keep us safe. So keep that in mind. All right. One of the things we're going to be doing now is uh, we're going to go to God in prayer. And um, we've, we've certainly had some, uh, some challenges uh, in our congregation. We've prayed people through stuff. And we've got another one of those on our hands. Um, Jim Miller, many of you know, was, um, was, has been in the hospital for the past week. And uh, Jim has been diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. Uh, they're going to have a conference with the doctors and the oncologist tomorrow, and then they're going to get more information about uh, what stage they're at. But we know for sure that Jim is going to begin chemotherapy on, on August 10 for pancreatic cancer. And so uh, Jim and Dana and Maddie and Lydia and Emma, if you're watching, and I'm sure you are, we just want you to know how much we love you uh, we want you to know how our hearts ache along with you. And we want you to know that we are here with you every step of this journey. That you have the full prayer support of this church family. And, um, and, and we're going to do everything we can to support you. And, and most importantly, God is with you. In fact, God is already ahead of you on this journey. And um, you will never do one, one step of this journey outside of his presence. So we're going to pray for, uh, for the Millers this morning specifically as just uh, kind of a, an emblem of our ongoing prayers for them. So let's go to our Heavenly Father and pray. Our Father in heaven, and we thank you that we can call you our Father. We thank you that, that your posture towards us is one of love, one of deep affection, and, and one of, uh, of great care. And we thank you that in addition to uh, expressing yourself and revealing, revealing yourself as our Father, you are also revealing yourself as the Lord of the universe because that's who you are. 
And as we face some of the, the deepest challenges in life and, and the greatest obstacles and, and difficulties, we need a Heavenly Father. We need a Father who is capable of making any change that needs to be made, a God who is strong enough to do not just what we can ask, but maybe even exceed that in the most creative of ways. That's who you are. And so we thank you that we can bring these concerns to you this morning. So we do, Lord, we cry out to you as our Heavenly Father on behalf of, of the Miller family. Lord, we pray for Jim as he gets ready to begin um, uh, an experience that he certainly wouldn't have imagined. We pray that you would strengthen him for what he's going to go through with chemotherapy. And Lord, we pray that, that these treatments would be extremely effective at, at treating his cancer. We pray that, that even now you would be addressing this issue in his body, that you would even now be bringing healing to him. Lord, we, we pray that you would prepare him emotionally, not just physically for this. We pray for the family, for Dana and the girls. And Lord, we pray that you would surround them with, with peace that is, is surprising, even shocking to them. That as they think about what it's going to be like, that the experience will not be nearly as difficult because your presence will be with them so abundantly and, and so uh, tangibly and palpably. Lord, we ask that, um, that during this time they would see you uh, on, and that they would see your grace on every horizon. Uh, Lord, we, we thank you that when we go through life that, and we face these challenges, whether it's cancer, whether it's um, our need for healing from an emotional struggle, from a physical challenge, that we can count on you, that you're a God who gives abundant grace. Lord, we think of those in our church family who are dealing with uh, prospective losses right now, people who are dealing with um, uh, relatives and family members who are on hospice. And Lord, we thank you that in the face of death, we have a living hope, that we have a Savior who has conquered death. And, and even though there's certainly sadness and loss associated with it, that the, the greatest fear, the, the, the sting of death, has been taken away because the grave is empty and because Jesus is alive. And so we thank you, God, for sending a son who would come and die for us and who would conquer death for us as well. Lord, um, we thank you that as our Father, your ultimate goal is to bring renewal to us, that uh, you will give us new bodies and that, um, that you will make us new. And we thank you that that's also what you're going to do with your creation. And we're grateful for opportunities to express the coming newness even now in this world. And we thank you for um, organizations like World Renew who are doing that here in the United States and around the world. Lord, as we um, are already looking at our second hurricane of the season and, and probably more to come, we thank you that there are people who are willing to go and to be a part of the renewal and the rebuilding process. So, Lord, we pray that you will uh, provide for World Renew in terms of finances and volunteers. And, Lord, we pray that you would make us a source of that provision as well, that, um, that our gifts here this morning and perhaps even our willingness to go and to serve would be part of your renewal in this world. So we ask, God, that... that uh, in our service uh, this morning and um, whether we do that uh, electronically or on our way out or sending a check to church, we ask that you would use the money that we give to bring renewal both to our community here but also around the world. So God, we thank you that, um, that death has been conquered, that the old order of things is passing away, that Jesus is alive and he is our living hope. And we pray in his name. Amen. Let's stand together and sing another song. How great the chasm that lay between us. How high the mountain I could not climb. In desperation I turned to heaven and spoke your name into the night then through the darkness 
your loving kindness is all through the shadows of my soul. The work is finished, the end is written. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Who could imagine so great a mercy? What heart could fathom such boundless grace? The God of ages stepped down from glory to wear my sin and bear my shame. The cross has spoken, I am forgiven. The King of kings calls me his own. Beautiful Savior, I'm yours forever. Jesus Christ, my living hope. And hallelujah, praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah, death has lost its grip on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Hallelujah. And hallelujah. Praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah. Death has lost its grip on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Then came the morning that sealed the promise. Your very body began to breathe. Out of the silence, the roaring lion declared the grave has no claim on me. Then came the morning that sealed the promise. Your very body began to breathe. Out of the silence, the roaring lion declared the grave has no claim on me. Jesus, yours is the victory. And hallelujah, praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah, death has lost its grip on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name, Jesus Christ, my living hope. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Jesus Christ, my living hope. How great the chasm that lay between us. How high the mountain I could not. seated. Uh, just a note before we, uh, before we turn to God's Word, um, if you are here this morning, feel free to, and you uh, brought an offering, feel free to drop it on, in a box on your way out. Um, you can always use our app or go to our website and give electronically or send a check to church. Just a few ways that you can continue to contribute to the ministries here. And um, we are so grateful for your faithful support over these last few months. It's been um, truly a blessing to see the way that, uh, that God is providing for us through your faithfulness and generosity. So thank you very much for that. There are two kinds of people in the world. Yeah, here we go, right? The two kinds of people in the world uh, bit, you know, there are, but, but I've noticed this. There are people who tend to follow the rules. There are rule followers. They, they just, if there's a rule, they just feel compelled to follow it. 
And there are also people in this world who just, nah, not so much. In fact, if, if you're married, probably one of you is a rule follower and the other of you is not so much. That's just my experience. I won't tell you what I am and what Sarah is, uh, but, but that tends to be the case often. So, but you know, I think maybe more to the point this morning is not so much that there's two kinds of people, but that there are two different kinds of rules. There are, there are rules that are really important for us to pay attention to, rules that, that we really need to heed. And then there are rules that maybe we can take more as a recommendation or just a suggestion. So I'd like to give you a few, uh, just a couple of examples of each of those kinds of rules. Let's, let's start with the rules that tend to be more suggestions, you know? So here's the first one. 35, 37, 39, 42, you know, I mean, I've observed that many people uh, see this not so much as a hard and fast rule, but more of a recommendation, okay? So here's another one. Again, general guideline, right? I mean, how many people actually count the items? Typically, we look down at our cart and we say, yeah, it's about 20, and, and we just go for it. But on the other hand, there are some rules where it's very important for us to heed them and to pay attention to them. And here's one example of those kinds of rules. Now, I have no idea what would happen to you if you, uh, if you went swimming in this water, but probably nobody wants to find out. It doesn't sound good. This is a rule that, that we do well to follow. Here's one more example of, of a rule like that. <laughs> Probably want to pay attention to this one. Um, we are wise to, to, to heed this rule and to follow it to the letter of the law. Well, rules are what we're going to be talking about this morning because that is what uh, Paul, the author of the letter to the Colossians, is talking about in the passage that we're up to. We're up to Colossians chapter 2, verses 16 through 23, and uh, you can follow along in your Bibles, you can follow along on your device, or you can simply watch the screen and follow along there as I read. So Colossians 2, 16 through 23. Therefore, do not let anyone judge you by what you eat or drink, or with regard to a religious festival, a new moon celebration, or a Sabbath day. These are a shadow of the things that were to come. The reality, however, is found in Christ. Do not let anyone who delights in false humility and the worship of angels disqualify you. Such a person also goes into great detail about what they have seen. They are puffed up with idle notions by their unspiritual mind. They have lost connection with the head, from whom the whole body, supported and held together by its ligaments and sinews, grows as God causes it to grow. Since you died with Christ to the elemental spiritual forces of this world, why, as though you still belong to the world, do you submit to its rules? Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch. These rules, which have to do with things that are destined to perish with use, are based on merely human commands and teachings. Such regulations indeed have an appearance of wisdom with their self-imposed worship, their false humility, and their harsh treatment of the body, but they lack any value in restraining sensual indulgence. So Paul is talking here about rules. And before we really dive into the heart and soul of this passage, I want to um, do two things. The first thing is I want to clarify, or uh, for, I want to review something that really sets the context for Paul's discussion of rules, and that is the gospel. This is something that we talked about last week, about the three parts of the gospel as it pertains to each of us as individuals. And so uh, we identified in last week's passage three different aspects. First of all, that we died with Christ, that we were raised with Christ, and finally, that we are forgiven by Christ. So uh, the first part about having died with Christ, what this means is that the person that you are that just can't get it right 
or get it together. That person has died with Jesus. The, the person that you are that is beset by depression, the person that you are that can't get on top of an addiction, the person that you are that finds it so hard to forgive or becomes easily angered, that person has died with Jesus. The person that sabotages you all the time has died with Christ and has been buried with him. The person that has been killing you has been put to death with Christ and you are now free from that person. That's the first part of the good news is that we are free from who we used to be. But there's more. We've been raised with Christ. And what this means is we get the ultimate do-over in life. You and I get a fresh start. And this time, raised to a new life, we don't have to do it on our own strength. We don't have to do it by our own wisdom. Instead, we can do it, we can do life with the power of God. We can do life with the guidance of the Holy Spirit within us. And the chances for success skyrocket. In fact, they are guaranteed by God himself when we approach life that way. Finally, we've been forgiven by Jesus. And what this means is everything we have ever done wrong, are currently doing wrong or will do wrong, no longer counts against us. It's not just that we skate out of the consequences, because in life there are still consequences, but what it means is as God looks at us, he no longer sees our sin. He sees us, new people raised with Christ, because our sin has been nailed to the cross by Jesus, and it's as if we've never even committed those things. So that's the gospel, and it is that context our new life in Christ that Paul engages in this discussion about rules. And that's important. It's important for us to know that it's not rules as they apply to who we used to be. But the question now is, how do the rules apply to who we are now in Christ? So the second thing I want to do before we dive in is, is clarify what rules we're talking about. So, so which rules are we talking about here? Now I want to start by saying this that Paul is not talking about in this discussion on rules. He's not talking about the Ten Commandments. He's not talking about the, the more global rules that God has given us for life. Those are still operative in effect and they serve as guides for how we can live lives that, that are pleasing to God and, and that bear out our new identity in Him. So, Ten Commandments, the Great Commandment, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. These are still things that God calls us to obey and, and to live our life with these as rules and guides. So in this discussion here, Paul's not talking about the, the global laws like the Ten Commandments. What Paul is talking about are rules that are based on our culture, on our society, on our tradition. Rules that have largely developed through uh, the way that, that humans have structured organizations and things like that. Um, and by Paul's day, the Pharisees and teachers of the law had come up with a whole bunch of different rules that needed to be followed. Sometimes, uh, for example, in verse 16 we read this. Paul says, don't let anyone judge you by what you eat or drink or with regard to a religious festival. So again, these are more ceremonial and ritual laws. They're the specific applications sometimes of the Ten Commandments. So, you know, God says, honor the Sabbath day and keep it holy, uh, or remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. So how do we apply that to our lives? And that's where sometimes we get into these rules of humans. And we have these things today as well. Uh, and, and that's probably one of the primary ones, at least for me growing up, what you can and can't do on Sunday. You know, can, can you watch TV? Can you play catch but not baseball? Things like that. Another, another one is just church attendance in general. I mean, is, is it mandatory for a Christian to come to a worship service or to join us online for a worship service? Another example of these kinds of rules might be the kinds of media that you take in. 
Is it okay to watch R-rated movies if you're a Christian? If you're a Christian, is it okay to listen to music that has the occasional swear word in it? Is that acceptable? It can be the way you dress. Like, where is the line with, with, with modesty? Where do you set that line? Is it okay to drink alcohol or should we not be drinking alcohol? These are the kinds of rules that have emerged over the years and Christians have different perspectives on these. And these are the sort of thing that Paul is addressing here. Next, I'd like to talk to you about chemistry. And um, we'll see why in just a minute. But in chemistry, there are two kinds of bonds that, uh, that we see, and generally speaking, two ways that atoms are, are bound together, that, that, they, that they bond. And the first one is called a strong bond, and the second one is called a weak bond. And it's pretty self-explanatory, right? So we'll start with a strong bond. A strong bond is a bond that requires a great deal of energy for, that, uh, for, that, for the two atoms to come apart. So one example of that is what's called a covalent bond. And in chemistry, what this means is that two atoms will actually share an electron. Uh, so one example of that is water. And what you have is the two hydrogen atoms that connect to an oxygen atom to form water. But the way that they bo they're bonded to each other is by sharing a part of themselves. They actually share an electron that, that becomes a common part of all the atoms in this uh, molecule. And so as a result, what you have is a very stable a very stable substance in water. Water is hard to, to disconnect the atoms. It stays intact because a covalent bond is a very strong one. In chemistry, there are also weak bonds. And these bonds tend to be generated more by proximity, like two atoms being in the neighborhood together. And sometimes that happens through a weak magnetic attraction. So one example would be Van der Waals forces where you have a, a negatively charged um, electron and there's a positive charge in the nucleus of the, of the atom and so they generally are attracted to each other. The problem here is it's not hard for these bonds to be broken. If another atom happens by that has a stronger electrical um, charge, it, this bond will be easily broken and the one atom will join up with, with that one or maybe there's another force that comes along and can separate these. It's a weak bond between these two atoms. All right, so what in the world does that have to do with rules? We're getting there. The word religion comes from the Latin word religare, and what that Latin word means is to bind, to bind oneself to something. So specifically and literally speaking, religion is a way that we bind ourselves to a set of rules or to a set of practices. So, for example, in the Muslim religion, Muslims bind themselves to a set of rules. It's known as the five pillars of Islam. So, uh, if you are a Muslim person, you would bind yourself to praying three times a day, uh, pilgrimage to Mecca, almsgiving, fasting during special seasons, and a profession that Allah is the only God. Those are the pillars of Islam, and, and a Muslim will bind himself or herself to those things. As Christians, there is a set of rules that we have, have often bound ourselves to as well. And I think for the, uh, often these are not necessarily the Ten Commandments, but they're a set of practices that we do and a set of rules that, that we have decided it's important to, to follow. So let me just give you a few examples of this. Um, gathering for worship, I referred to that earlier. But as Christians, one practice of our religion that we have been pretty clear about is that we need to gather weekly uh, in, in groups for worship or, or online if, if that's where you're at during these times. This is an important part of the Christian faith. And so for most Christians, we've bound ourselves to, to having a weekly worship experience. Giving is another example. And, and in a lot of Christian traditions, we call this a tithe, which means 10%. And so Christians have often bound themselves to giving 10% 
of their income to the church and to mission. For many Christians, there's an experience that is important to have. Uh, it's a moment of salvation. Uh, in, in some Christian traditions, it's important to know exactly when you became a Christian. Like, this much of my life, nope, I, I, I wasn't a Christian. But then I had this moment and often prayed this prayer. And after that, now I'm a Christian. So being able to put your finger on that is another example of of a thing that Christians have bound themselves to, a practice or experience. When it comes to the sacraments, baptism is one where in baptism, some traditions like ours, we baptize infants as part of God's covenant. Other traditions, they wait until a person is older and can make a, a conscious profession of their faith before baptism takes place. In different Christian traditions, there tends to be an emphasis on certain um, social and political values. Some Christian traditions and churches, it's important in those traditions to emphasize this set of values here about society and culture. Other Christian traditions choose different um, issues to place their importance and their priority on. So depending on what you're in, there's other things there that you might bind yourself to. There's dates that we celebrate. I mean, most Christians do Easter and Christmas. I mean, even though we don't know exactly the date that Jesus was born, uh, we don't know the exact date that Jesus rose from the dead. In fact, we celebrate it on a different date every year. But we've still bound ourselves to the celebration of those days. And we do Pentecost, we do Ash Wednesday, and some traditions have many more other special days that they celebrate as well. So as Christians, we've got a number of different things that certain traditions insist on doing, practices that we bind ourselves to. And there doesn't have to be anything wrong with this, but there can be some problems associated with it. And this is what Paul is pointing out to the Colossians, and he points it out to us by extension as well. So I want to, I want to, um, I want to talk about some problems with the rules. And the first one, and this one is implicit in what Paul says here, is that the rules, the rules can never bring us salvation. We can never become right with God by following rules. It, it, it just can't happen. And so if we look to the rules as a way to secure for ourselves a relationship with God, it's not going to work like that. In fact, we will drive ourselves crazy and we will work ourselves to the bone and live without that security. So um, the rules are not going to gain for us salvation. Another thing um, that Paul says at the end of this passage in verse 23, he says, Such regulations indeed have an appearance of wisdom, but he goes on to say, They lack any value in restraining sensual indulgence. Rules don't make saints. Rules cannot make you a better person. You will not become a better person because you follow the rules. Paul says that just because there's a rule against, um, against adultery doesn't mean that adultery will stop happening. In fact, sometimes like what we found in the Old Testament, when there were uh, a bunch of laws, people just made them curious. And, they, and it actually led to more sin happening. So Paul's clear about this. Just because there's a rule about something doesn't mean that it's going to be followed. And it's not going to make you a better person. A third thing that Paul points out in verse 17, he says this, These rules are a shadow of the things that were to come. Rules are often a shadow. And if you see a friend and you're talking to them, you're not going to talk to their shadow. You're going to look at them and talk. We, I mean, shadows are, are, are nothing. They're just uh, an outline of the person that's really important. And we're going to talk more about that in just a minute. But finally, uh, and, and this gets to where we've been, rules cannot bind us to God. And I suppose that's the problem with religion, is that we have looked to rules to, we've bound ourselves to rules as a way to try and bind ourselves to God. And Paul says the rules aren't going to do that. In verse, uh, 
in verse 19, Paul says that people who insist on following all these rules have lost connection with the head. Their bond was weak and it's been broken. You know, rules can put us in proximity to God. They can, they can get us close to God. They can create some level of attraction. But the problem is if we use rules as a way to bind ourselves to God, anytime something else comes along with a greater attraction, something more fun, some other great opportunity, the bond between us and God can be easily and quickly broken and we'll go off and follow that next thing. If we use rules to make our connection with God, then often when life gets difficult and challenging, what we discover is that, is that that bond can be easily broken. And as a pastor, I've seen this. People who thought they were doing everything the right way, but tragedy still struck. And in their disappointment and disillusionment, that bond was broken because the relationship was largely predicated on following a set of rules. Rules cannot bind us to God. Rules are there to point to something greater. Rules are there for us to continue to look in the right direction. Rules are often the, the hand that points us to God. And if we get obsessed with the hand that's pointing to God, then we are missing the point. The rules are there to direct our gaze to God. And again, Paul says that these rules are a shadow of the things that were to come. They're just a shadow. And, and the thing about a shadow is you can't, you can't touch a shadow. You, you can't feel a shadow. But God sent us someone that we could touch, that we could feel, that we could see with our eyes. He sent us his son Jesus. And Jesus was so much greater, is so much greater than the rules that were pointing to him. Jesus is the reality that these shadows were pointing to. Jesus fulfills all the feasts and the regulations. God commanded his Old Testament people that they should celebrate the Passover. And Jesus came to be the ultimate Passover lamb whose blood rescues us from sin and death. God commanded his Old Testament people to celebrate a day of atonement where the sins of the community would be placed on an animal and that animal would be killed. And Jesus came as an ultimate sacrifice for our sins. So instead of being bound to God by following a set of rules, we are bound to God by Jesus Christ. You see, Jesus doesn't just get us near God. He doesn't just create some kind of a, of a weak attraction for God. Jesus actually unites us with God. In Jesus, we share a part of God. We are bound together like a, a covalent bond where, where two atoms share an electron. Jesus comes in and now through Jesus, God shares in, in, the, in flesh and in the human nature, and we share in God's divine nature. Jesus is where that overlap happens. And we, we are bound to God, and that bond is unbreakable. So here's how the rules can function in our lives today. Rather than serving the rules, the rules are now in place to serve us. Rather than serving the rules so that you can draw closer to God or so that I can draw closer to God, the rules can serve us in that pursuit. The rules serve us in becoming more like Jesus. God has already bound us to him in Jesus Christ. And we now look for ways to live out that new reality. And the rules can help us do that. So let me give you a couple of examples here. We'll go back to some that we've talked about. Church attendance. You know, and maybe I shouldn't be the one to break this to you, but you can be saved and go to heaven without coming to church. I mean, there will be people in heaven who, uh, who had a saving relationship with Jesus but never were much for going to church. So it's not something that you have to do. But we've discovered, many of us, 
that being a part of a worshiping community, that coming together on a regular basis to celebrate God's faithfulness has been a way that we can become more like Jesus. That rule isn't something we have to do to, for salvation, but instead that rule, that practice becomes something that helps us, that serves us as we pursue our relationship with God. What about movies and, and media? You know, in Christ we are free. We're free to watch whatever movie we want, to listen to whatever movie we want. But just because we can do that doesn't mean that it's necessarily going to help us grow in our relationship with God. And so sometimes the rules are there as wisdom to keep us from becoming distracted in our pursuit of a relationship with God. Uh, the rules are there to guide us. They're there to help us. They're there to protect us on our spiritual journey. It's not about following the rules anymore. It's about choosing to do the things and to adopt the practices that will help you and me become more like Jesus. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you that we are completely free through your Son, Jesus Christ. We thank you that we are bound to you with an eternal bond, that, that we are so fully united with you in Christ that nothing can ever tear us away or, or break us apart. And so we thank you that we're free to pursue life. And we thank you that there are best ways that we can do that. We're grateful that you've given us guides in our life some that come directly from your word, but others that we've just simply developed over the years. Ways that, that your followers have discovered helps to become more like your son, Jesus. So God, give us discernment as we weigh these things out. Help us to know that your love is not conditioned upon our following of the rules, but simply on what Jesus has done for us. And in freedom, help us to understand the rules that can help move us towards you and the ones that maybe don't have any value in doing that. Again, we thank you for the freedom that we have in your son Jesus and we pray in his name. Amen. We're going to do something again right now that uh, we, we've been doing throughout our, our shutdown and we started it again uh, last week. But we're going to ask you to, um, whether you're by yourself, you can reflect on this. If you're uh, with a spouse, you can have a little conversation or whether you're with your family. Take just a couple minutes to talk about a question. So here's our talk about it question for this morning. Um, and th there's really two options or maybe you can do both of them. What is one rule that has helped you to become more like Jesus? Or, or and, what is a rule that really didn't help at all in becoming like Jesus? So I'll just give you an example to get the conversation started. I have found for me one rule that has helped me grow in my faith has been uh, giving and, and, and even tithing. Now, in, in Christ, we're free to, to give whatever we want. But I have found that when I have given generously, that it has helped me not be distracted by financial matters, and it has helped me to stay focused on Jesus instead of a lot of the other things. So that's a, a rule that has helped me. And there's some rules that really hasn't helped me at all. Like one, one rule that sometimes is that we should only listen to Christian music. And for me personally, I've found that music that it wouldn't necessarily be deemed Christian um, has really been inspiring and helped me to see and understand God in a different way. So those are two examples. But what about you? What are some rules of humans that you've uh, been taught or encouraged to follow? And what of those have been helpful for you and what not so much? So right now, whether you're uh, watching in, in the gym, whether you're at home or right here, we're going to take just a couple of minutes to have a quick conversation about this. And then I'll be back to wrap up our service in just a minute.
Would you please stand to receive a final blessing from God? This blessing comes to us from Paul's letter to the Romans. May the God of hope fill you with joy and peace as you trust in him. And may you overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. You can have a seat, and uh, we're going to be, um, we're gonna be uh, dismissed starting in the back. So if you want to go ahead and have a seat, you can enjoy the postlude. Um, some council members will dismiss you to go outside. I think the rain has stopped, so we can continue to have some fellowship out there. Have a great week, everyone.